Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Mom Hour. Welcome to a brand new year, 2021. Oh, my goodness. I am Sarah Powers. I am one half of the co-host team here at the Mom Hour. So if you are brand new, like, you know, your New Year's resolution is to listen to more podcasts and you just found us, welcome. We are so glad you're here. My co-host Megan is not on the mic with me today because on the first Friday of every month, we take turns interviewing a guest. So our show isn't an interview show as its primary format, but we do these voices episodes once a month and we take turns. So you can get to know Megan coming up on Tuesday or on literally any other episode of the podcast that isn't one of our voices interviews, the ones where it's just the two of us doing our thing. And for those of you listening who know exactly what this show is all about and who we are, welcome back. Happy New Year. This feels kind of fun to have an episode that airs on the very first day of a new year. And, you know, we toyed with the idea of pushing back this month's Voices interview to next Friday because today is a holiday. But then we realized that my guest today is actually perfect for a New Year's Day episode. Today, I'm talking with Sarah Hart Unger, whom many of you know as one half of the Best of Both Worlds podcast, which is all about working motherhood. Sarah is a practicing physician with three young kids. And on Best of Both Worlds, she and Laura Vanderkam talk about issues related to working motherhood. Well, last year... And oh my gosh, we can now say 2020 is last year. That is amazing. So last year, Sarah launched a solo podcast called Best Laid Plans, all about planners, planning, organizing, and goal setting. And it's so well done. I have a planner personality, but I've never gotten super into the paper planner culture, all the notebooks and bullet journals and all of that. Sarah makes it sound fun and approachable, and I could listen to her talk about her goal setting and monthly review processes all day. Sarah was also my guest for the first Voices interview episode of 2020, so one year ago. And it's very intentional that I'm bringing her back today, not just because she's a great guest, but because I was dying to ask her what 2020 was like for someone who had big plans and goals for the year and whose whole life kind of revolves around plans and planning. We have a great conversation about what she learned from 2020, how she's approaching annual goal setting and planning in 2021, and how we can kind of pandemic proof our goals for the coming year. We also take a bunch of listener questions, and it was so much fun to let Sarah loose on some of your nitty gritty planner questions. You're going to want to bookmark the show notes for this episode at themomhour.com slash voices 56, because there are a bunch of links that Sarah recommends throughout our conversation. Okay, get ready, friends. Grab a cup of tea or your green smoothie or whatever shiny new habit you're busting out today and enjoy my conversation with Sarah Hart Unger. Hi, Sarah. Happy New Year. Happy New Year! I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) Well, um, I am so excited to have you back. Our listeners are so excited for this episode. So peek behind the curtain, everyone. We are recording this actually in December. So that was an imaginary Happy New Year. But we're just really excited to have you back, Sarah, for the very first Voices interview of 2021. 
because you were my guest one year ago in January of 2020 before we had any idea about the year that was about to go down. So how are you doing? I am doing pretty well over here. You know, life has returned to some sort of new normal. I have used the most numbers of planners that I have ever used in 2020. (laughs) You're like, maybe if I switch planners, this will all start going better. I'm not even kidding. That was a full on coping mechanism for me. And I think part of it was like the idea that they would have some sort of magical power. And part right. of it was the idea that it was just like a really nice, distracting coping mechanism. Yeah. And, and a comfort. I mean, Megan and I all year, all through 2020, we talked about small comforts, leaning into the things that bring us joy. And for you, planners and planning bring you joy. So yeah, even if it wasn't going to, you know, cure COVID, I can totally see how that would just be a comfort. So I love that. Um, Well, I don't want to get too far ahead before kind of bringing listeners up to speed if they don't know you. And if they don't remember last year's episode, it's fine if you haven't listened. But um, Sarah is a podcast host of two podcasts, The Best of Both Worlds with Laura Vanderkam. And you have your own show that launched this past year called Best Laid Plans, which is all about planners and planning, right? Like this is your sandbox, your playground. It is. It's definitely my... um sort of amateur sandbox because I have, I am a physician. I have like a a different job in addition to this. So I am not the professional that Sarah Powers is on this microphone, but I have a passion for it. And since I had gotten some podcasting experience um, doing Best of Both Worlds, which has been so much fun and which is continuing, I just kept finding myself going on planning related tangents and just figured again, like it's 2020, who doesn't need another fun digression to think about? (laughs) I love it. I just listened to a few episodes um, and I was so just kind of comforted and inspired. And we'll talk more about how listeners can find your show. In fact, I think a lot of what we referenced today, you'll be able to point listeners to episodes of Best Laid Plans where you've really gone in deep because, of course, we, you know, we only have an hour today, but you have gone into detail on so many areas of not just planning, but productivity and organization and goal setting Um, So I just think that's so cool. And yes, you are a full time, well, nearly full time, right? Working physician. So um, that's yeah, you've got a lot on your plate. I love it. It's really, really fun, though. Um, And how old are your kids? Before we get into this, we should also kind of set the context there because you still have little ones. Yeah. So I am a mom, our super fan in part Mm -hmm. because my kids are like your kids just several years behind, I believe. So my my youngest is three or yeah, she's three. My second one is going to be almost seven. And then my third one is like eight and a half. So, yes, definitely in the thick of those kind of school age fun years with a preschooler yeah. slash toddler kind of trailing behind a little bit coming coming up behind but I feel like it gets um so much easier like it will continue to feel so much easier as that little one just kind of keeps up with the bigs so that's really fun well I want to talk about 2020 I know listeners are hearing this in 2021 and we all just want to put it behind us but um, we need to talk about this. I am so curious as someone who loves planning and goal setting, and you and I talked about your system for setting annual goals and revisiting them monthly. You talked about your quintile system, which I'm not even going to go into now, but I really thought about it. I wrote it in my own little journal. Um, it's fascinating and so smart. So we talked about all that. This is like your world that you love. And come March, for me, it was like March 12th. I know everyone has like a different day <laughs> where like it really became real, really fast. For us in California, it was like somewhere between the 12th and the 16th, 17th, where like, you know what got real. So what? just walk me through kind of the emotional experience of both the early days of the pandemic when truly plans, vacations were canceled, spring break was canceled, school was off, like the big things. But then maybe also take us through kind of the emotional process you went through getting back to some kind of planning, some kind of goal setting, some kind of tracking your habits. I'm just going to turn it over because I am personally fascinated in what what that was like for you. Well, here's the funny thing. I mean, I actually would love to go back and listen to my old episode because I feel like it's going to be sort of like watching a, I don't know, like a plane crash or something, listening to the things I'm saying about the promise of this wonderful new year at the beginning (laughs) of a new decade. But um, so I had done a lot of planning and a lot of trips. I had 
so many like exciting trips on my calendar. And like, I really thought of the year in terms of my little quintiles, which I'm not going to give them a detail, but it's just a way of dividing the year into five instead of four. Mm -hmm. And I had kind of like a big trip in almost every quintile, including like our grand finale, which was like a Disney trip um, for my daughter's third birthday in December. (laughs) Like I had already booked that like that far in advance. So yeah, for somebody that really gets a lot of enjoyment out of thinking ahead, I will say it was definitely hard for me. And um, I think that some of the really hardcore planning types did suffer a lot in the beginning Mm -hmm. of the pandemic because of that, because you just had these carefully lined up blocks and we're so used to being able to check off everything. And then all of a sudden, everything came into question. Now, it's funny you Mm -hmm. mentioned March because I... um, I happen to work with somebody who does a lot of immunology research and he's oh. also from China. So oh. he was like telling me stuff a lot earlier than that. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> so maybe I had a little bit more of like imp- sense of impending doom before it became completely yeah. real. Um, but at the same time, obviously none of us knew how much and how profoundly it was going to impact all of our habits and goals and plans. And for a while, I completely kind of like retreated. And I Mm. think that it's okay, even if you're like the most planning planner kind of a person to sometimes just realize that things are crazy and you need to take a break. I didn't take a break from life. I mean, I still had to do work. And actually, I started blogging daily during that time. Mm. And I like I started a streak. It was like COVID day one. Like, (laughs) so I sort of found my alternate coping mechanisms to focus on. And I can go into that in a little bit, how important habits kind of became to me in Mm -hmm. the thick of what was going on. But I think there definitely was a moment where it was just like, well, okay, my beautiful planner had a lot of things in it. They're not going to happen. My family's still healthy. Let's think about what's important. And then I wasn't kidding about getting a new planner. I actually found it very therapeutic to be like, well, all those events are now not happening. So yep. let's start fresh so that we can focus on what can happen and what will actually be happening. And it was much um, more freeing and calming in a way to look at blank pages than it was to keep seeing all of these events. things out. Yes, exactly. Um, I want to jump in and just validate what you said about for certain personalities, this really did feel kind of um, like earth, like altering um, and and of course, we're sitting here knowing that that's speaking from a place of extreme privileges. Our our families were safe. Our kids were healthy. So we understand that it's just a vacation or it's just a like a pretty color coded calendar. But I do. I remember in our Facebook group for our listener community, checking in and just checking in on people's mental health and the things they were struggling with. And I cannot tell you, Sarah, how many people said, I'm such a planner that it is really hard for me to not know what the next two weeks is going to hold. And I've had so many conversations with people where we just said, um, it's, you, you have to shorten the gaze. I think Megan put it that way, like shortening the time that you're looking ahead because we just didn't know. And I'm speaking really like March, April, May. Um, I think in summer, certain areas of the country like started to be a little bit different, but in the spring, we couldn't, no one could plan. And, and I just want to validate that that felt like grieving for some people, even if, you know, they had the perspective that their, their families were safe and they were doing the right thing. And of course, like their problem, like that's not a huge problem in the grand scheme of things, but I think it still is worth mentioning. Yeah. Well, and the irony is I actually still had a lot of things that I kind of had to plan because even mm-hmm. though I could do some of my job from home and see patients via telehealth, Um, I, part of my job is to run a residency program and we had to figure out a way to like keep everybody going. And at a time when, I don't know, there was so much psychological distress, both within me and within everyone around me, um, that we just wanted to, you know, not do anything and just like grieve exactly what you said. We couldn't really. So there was still things that had to be done and had to be planned, just like for all of our listeners that have kids like the world can't stop. You can't retreat into a hole. You have a two year old like you have children. And in many cases, your child care um, options became very limited or disrupted. So it actually, you know, was a very busy time um, for probably many of the people. Yeah, uh, I agree. We heard we heard a lot of that, too, that not everybody is, you know, baking bread and stuck at home with nothing (laughs) to do. We have essential workers. We have teachers. We have you know, people in all kinds of positions in our listener community. So yeah, just wanted to kind of validate that that was a really 
strange, a very strange experience, especially for those who who rely on long term planning and short term planning and all of that. Um, so I, I want to ask you about your year end review process. And again, we are recording this in December. This is airing in January. But normally in a year, you would kind of look back, I think. I've listened to your episode about your month end review, but I'm going to guess that you, you typically look back at the year past before totally moving on to looking ahead. So what is that like as you look back on 2020? Are you doing some kind of a year end review <laughs> where you look at like, you know, normally you'd be looking at, did I accomplish my goals? Um, did I, you know, like, but so much got blown up. So what was that like? And and did you learn anything looking back at 2020? Yeah. So those are great questions. And thankfully I, they're very fresh in my mind because Laura and I just recorded a podcast on literally like that exact topic. Oh, cool. Okay. We'll link that up too. Um, <laughs> oh, great. I know we're, we're confusing the space time continuum a little bit here, but when will people hear that one in real that life? That one airs a couple weeks before this will air. So late. Okay, perfect. So we'll yeah. make sure to link it up. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm going to talk about year in review, but I want to go back really quickly to what you said about what Megan said about short. Yeah. What, is, what was it? Shortening, the, shortening your gaze. Oh, I love that because yeah. that's exactly what I did. So as I was saying, everything kind of got busy, but it was no longer really worth it to think about like three weeks from now and like, yeah. you know, six weeks from now, but it was still really, really, really important to think about each day. And so I became mm. like almost obsessive about it was the first time I ever used a, like a true full on bullet journal um, so that I could have like an entire dot grid page that I could control, control being a theme yeah. here in any way, shape or form and decide exactly how I was going to structure my days based on whatever I could control about them. Yeah. So like, OK, well, maybe I couldn't send my kids anywhere to school, but I could still do my Duolingo app, <laughs> whatever mm -hmm. it was, or take a walk around the block um, or, or, you know, whatever it may be or work related things. So I guess before, before I mention the review, I just, I did want to say, I think Megan's exactly right. And that can be a continued coping me mechanism as things mm -hmm. remain unpredictable. And I think there's actually a lot to be gained by not planning as much time, not spending as much time focusing on our wider horizons. I think it is important to do that periodically and purposefully. Right. But sometimes you just can't do that. And I think that's also completely OK. And so, yeah. And I also think yeah. there's a bit of self-preservation, right? Because like as we are doing this in December, January, we we hope that, say, by summertime 2021, things will look a lot different, but nobody really knows. And so there's a bit of it where like the long term planning, we're protecting ourselves against future disappointment. We all had so much cancellation and so much disappointment that I can see how even as things start to look hopeful, um, people are going to be protecting themselves from that, like booking a trip and having it canceled. We're going to be shy for a little, like we're going to be scared for a little while, I think of those long-term plans. A hundred percent. And what you said before about looking back and looking forward, I actually found looking back to be pretty poignant and pretty pleasant in a way. Again, that uh -huh. is because I'm privileged and lucky. And, um, you know, even though my husband like works in the hospital every day, and I work in the hospital half the time, like we've been really lucky and our family has stayed healthy and we've been able to keep our jobs and all of that kind of a thing. So looking back, I have, you know, really powerful memories of 2020, probably more than many other years, just because mm -hmm. the year was so incredibly different. And so thinking about the lessons I've learned and kind of some of the more powerful memories of like, you know, even things like as small as having a tiny Thanksgiving in our house and just mm -hmm. being the five of us, but actually really like enjoying that time and space that we had together in the quiet. Um, I don't know, looking back felt kind of good. So I do encourage you, especially if, if it's been a year that you were spared, you know, significant personal pain, or if there are bright spots, um, that it's still worth really thinking about what you learned in 2020 and what you have accomplished, because it's probably a lot more than you think. Like maybe you didn't do what you planned on, but since we still had the same number of minutes and hours to spend, even yeah. though they were spent differently, you probably took pivots that were really interesting and maybe learned some things. And it's, it's, you're going to want to look at that later. So I definitely think a, a review of 2020, if you're going to ever do a, a review of a past year, yeah. like this is the year to start. I just like got little goosebumps when you were talking because I think that's so powerful that we had the same number of minutes and months and everybody can joke about how time was so weird in 2020, like it dragged on. But then also all of a sudden it was October. So I think that's so powerful. Do you have like an, an actual concrete way that you would recommend doing that? Like just making a list of the the sweetest moments of the year or looking back through pictures or is it just kind of up to every how however anybody wants to do it 
Yeah. So, I mean, I am a person who does love to make yearly photo albums. So if you're not somebody who was writing things in a journal, so you don't have verbal stuff, then the easiest thing to be able to look through your life chronologically is to probably go through your phone and your calendar in your phone, if it's in your phone, Mm -hmm. and just kind of think about what the highlights are and maybe spend some time either putting together an album or writing a journal entry, um, thinking about like what making a list and they're everywhere, you know, what worked in 2020, what didn't, what lessons did I learn? Um, Because again, of course you can do that every year, but I actually think this year has even more to offer than kind of like your average year in that way. I'm so inspired by that. And I will say, even though listeners are hearing this the first week of January, that is not too late, right? I do. I feel like the January, you get this very lovely kind of fuzzy gray period for a couple of weeks where you definitely can still be doing that reflection as you come out of the new year before hitting it for 2021. So it's not too late if you're hearing this now to do your 2020 year in review. And Sarah, we'll definitely link up that episode of Best of Both Worlds too, because that sounds great. Sarah, you know when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh, minty essence in every bottle, so you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. We are welcoming a new sponsor today, Dr. Mom Butt Balm. Sarah, this might sound a little weird, but when my kids were babies, I actually really enjoyed changing diapers. It felt like a little time out to connect. Oh, yeah, Megan. I can totally remember that feeling of just kind of leaning in and enjoying a little moment in your routine. Yeah, but when my babies had diaper rash, it made the whole experience so much less fun for both of us. And back in those days, we didn't have great options for rash cream either. It was usually goopy, heavy, and full of dyes and preservatives and other things I didn't really want to put on my baby's butt. Well, the creator of Dr. Mom Butt Balm, who is a mom and also a doctor, had the same experience, Megan, and she did something about it. Dr. Mom Butt Balm is free of dyes, preservatives, and zinc oxide. It's easy to apply, easy to remove, and you don't have to use a lot to protect your baby's skin. I really love the way this balm feels. It's almost like a high-end skin cream. Very nice, no strong scent, and definitely nothing like the diaper rash creams I used to struggle with. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Okay, Sarah, so we're going to talk about looking forward into 2021. And we're also going to bring in a couple of the great listener questions that we got from our community and your super fans out there. But let's just let's just talk about 2021. Is it even worth making an annual plan this year? Like you have to sell me on this. I think, like I said, I think people are shy of of getting their hearts broken again. So what perspective can we take as we look at this year's annual plan and annual goal setting? Well, I would not book a bunch of vacations. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would recommend not doing. I don't okay. think we have a great understanding that like on, you know, July 7th, things will be better. And actually, right. let's be, let's face it. Like there's not going to be one day when it becomes clear, there's going to be a gradual continuum yeah. and there may be ebbs and flows in different directions. And we're going to have to accept that. And I think going in, Knowing that is probably healthier than thinking there's going to be a date when someone declares it all over. So (laughs) that said, you know, we've learned in 2020, I think that there are so many things you can do with your life, with your time, even when some of the big things were not available to us. So Mm -hmm. I'm personally setting goals for 2021. Um, I spent some time thinking about that recently and um, 
pretty much none of them require the pandemic to be over in any way, shape or form, because I Mm. think that's just healthier for me as a planner. I might have a couple ideas and I'll even like tell you all, like, I think it would be super wonderful and kind of a wonderful victory lap if we could take a family ski trip in the winter of 2021, if things are good by then, Mm -hmm. um, that would be great. And I have that like in my mind is like, okay, fantasy land that could happen. But I also already have in my mind that like, if that can't happen, we will do some kind of very low key alternative that only involves like driving our immediate family somewhere. So maybe having like contingency plans and still thinking of those as, you know, great options and thinking about things that can still happen. And Mm -hmm. there are so many things. There are exercise programs you can be doing at home or, you know, just outside. There are gatherings that you can be having digitally or even just like, um, you know, if you want to work on connection, just making yourself make phone calls or FaceTime calls. Mm -hmm. Like I wish I did more of that. And even though I would prefer to see people face to face, I know that I could do better. Um, even with the technology that we have, Mm -hmm. I think focusing on process goals, uh, can be really helpful. Um, I will give Laura credit for that. She was just using that phrase in, in our episode as we were doing it. So a process goal is not like lose 10 pounds or go to a ski trip. A process goal is like, I'm going to floss every night or I'm going to spend five minutes doing yoga in the evening or whatever it is. So these things are actions that are taken daily without any thought of what the specific result is going to be. Mm -hmm. And those are just as valid goals as sort of end product, big result goals. But you have much more control over your process goals, especially if you keep them appropriately modest. So I think you should give yourself time to think about 2021. But I also think you should sort of pandemic proof your goals. <laughs> I love that. I love that concept. And I love, um, I love thinking about how everybody has learned so much in the last nine months, um, about themselves, about what they need in terms of self-care and health. Um, so I love thinking about like, there is a clean slateness to this 2021, even though we're still very much in the pandemic. So it's like, if I knew now, if I know now what I know, the other way around. If I knew then what I know now, like how would I take care of myself in the winter months? How would I exercise? What habits would I have done? Because our learning curve was so steep in March and April, knowing how to like be in the same house with five people like day in and day out. We, we know how to do that. We may not like it, but we know how <laughs> to do it a lot better now. Um, and you and I both live in places where the sun shines most of the year and we know we're very lucky for that, but winter is a real thing and there are a couple months more of it. So I think, um, for the moms of young kids, especially, and if you live somewhere where it's dark and cold for the next couple of months, thinking about those daily habits, thinking about, um, putting things on the calendar to look forward to that are, as you say, pandemic proof. Um, it's just, we're just so much better off. I think in many ways than we were in March when it came out of seemingly out of the blue, it didn't come out of the blue, but you know what I mean? So yeah. Yes. What about habits? You talked a little bit about those process goals, but you do a lot of habit tracking and you talk a lot about habits in your best laid plans and in all of the stuff you do around planning. Are there, are there any things on your mind about habits during a pandemic. Um, I'm just thinking about things like screen time and like you said, flossing, yoga, whatever (laughs) it is. Like how do you go into 2021 with a renewed focus on habits? Habits were like my personal version of sourdough. Like (laughs) instead of baking sourdough, (laughs) I had little cute little check boxes of like five or six things that I want to do every day that I knew like fed my soul personally. And I tracked them on paper in my planner Um, I, I, they're kind of like at a, like a dashboard at the top of my each page. And you could also track them like on monthly, there's all different ways of tracking them. But I think I highly recommend doing this. I I'm going to do it even when the pandemic, I'm probably going to do it for the rest of my life. Let's be honest. And I didn't (laughs) always do it. So, um, but I found it very practical once you've gotten something incredibly ingrained in your life. The cool thing is then you can take it off. Like it Mm -hmm. actually, like, I have to admit this. It took me like years. Like I was 38 before I flossed regularly, (laughs) but I no longer need to put that on my dashboard because like it's completely ingrained or even like things like evening skincare used to be like kind of inconsistent and then it became very consistent. So you could take it off. So once something is just so part of your life, you can get rid of it, but there's probably a few things in your life that you know would make your life better if you kind of made sure you gave them daily attention. And it doesn't mean Mm -hmm. perfection 
by the way, like newsflash, I do not hit all habits every day, nor do I expect myself to. And I had mm-hmm. a recent, um, somebody wrote in and it like almost broke my heart. Like, how do you handle it if you only did something 20 days in the month? And it's not 30. And it's like, well, that's wonderful. You celebrate the 20 days. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I think there's so much power to be had in tracking and thinking about your habits in a pandemic. And you can track them in really simple ways that are still very powerful. And I actually do recommend finding some way to track them daily, even if it's just in Mm -hmm. one little notebook. Because even if you're like keeping a little monthly roster, knowing that you have a page to like fill out every day, at least for me, is extremely motivating. Um, yeah. Other people are more motivated by like others, like, um, mm-hmm. you know, Gretchen Rubin's types. If you're an obliger, you may be more motivated by texting your friend at the end of every day and telling them which of the habits that, that you did so that they can text you. And it's kind of yeah. like accountability, but some way of checking in on yourself to make sure you're doing the things that you feel like make your life better. Yeah. And I would even add to that, that sometimes we get excited in the new year to add like 42 new habits. Um, I actually think it's worth thinking about the the things you're already doing some of the time. Like for me, I go on a walk um, three or four days a week. It would be much easier for me to decide to make um, daily walking kind of a like a real rock or a real like commitment than it would to be to start with lifting weights every day or like doing like a cardio dance class on Zoom every day because I'm already kind of halfway there. So I think that's another nice way to look at the habits you're already doing, but maybe not as consistently or as in in as structured a way, um, because then you can feel really good about like, I just took this thing from like some t- something I sometimes kind of do to to a real ingrained habit. So yes. And thought. even if that's not going from three days a week to seven days a week, if you make it from three days a week to five days a week, that's just that much more care that you're giving yourself and you're going to feel good about that progress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited to start to dive into listener questions. We got so many, but the first couple I want to take have, I think, fit nicely into this big picture kind of annual plan for 2021. So Julie wrote in and Julie must be a super fan of yours because she already knew about your quintile system. And again, for those who are just catching up, the quintiles are the year divided into five sections, but they're not equal sections. They're more divided by natural kind of rhythms of the year. Do you want to just really briefly kind of say what <laughs> yes. those are? Because it's so good. Yeah, they're they're defined by school rhythms. So these rhythms may not fit everybody who doesn't have kids. But since most of you guys do, I'll just mention them. One is from January 1st to whenever spring break starts. The second mm-hmm. is the end of spring break to the end of the school year. The third one is the time your kids off for the summer. The fourth one is the beginning of school until November or October 30th, like Halloween. And then mm-hmm. the, the last one is November 1st to December 31st, which I call reflection season because it's like celebrations yeah. and reflection and like thinking about. So I, I like designate an entire season for that so that it makes me actually do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember last year I wrote I wrote them down in my little journal, which is kind of like a paper planner, like and um and I counted the days of each and they weren't equal. But they no, were not equal not. in terms of days. But in terms of life rhythms, they make so much sense. Um, And so Julie asked, she said, how does Sarah come up with the quintile goals for each of the major life categories? And you might have to explain what she means because she's clearly already a fan. But she (laughs) says, I struggle with the big picture planning and the goal setting. I have many to do lists and things that are more urgent. But the big picture plan has always eluded me. And I will just say, Julie, I am the same. I'm I am pretty darn productive with my urgent and immediate to-do lists. Um, and I can project plan the heck out of something that's going to happen in the next three weeks, six weeks, but I'm not very good with, um, longer term stuff. So I'm eager for this answer too. Well, the first thing that comes up is you have to figure out if you actually feel like there's a void there. And that's Mm -hmm. like when you mention yourself and how successful you are and how happy it comes off that you are on your podcast. And I think Mm -hmm. it's I think it's genuine. Like, you know, maybe it's okay. Like maybe maybe there aren't things that are missing. So it's not like I don't want anyone to ever think like, oh, like I didn't fill out each category for each quintile. So I'm a failure of a human. Like I enjoyed (laughs) Usually I can come up with something, but I also don't think that anybody needs to pressure themselves to do so. Um, But my thoughts for Julie are also like, make sure you give yourself some protected time to actually do this. Because I also Mm. find that unless I like say, okay, on this morning when I'm without the kids and I have two hours and nothing else that I'm supposed to do, I'm going to think about planning unless that happens it's actually really easy just to just not really ever fit it in. And planning actually does and sort of goal, vision setting, long term planning, it requires a pretty rested like you ha- you can't you can't be like super tired um, 
and do that well. Because I think it's actually like the more higher processing centers of our brain that are are needed to do that. So I think number one, make sure you have the time and space to do it. Um, And then number two, make sure that you really want things in each area and think about like what your vision is, like what's missing. Are your are your weeks looking like you want your weeks to look like? You might want to do some exercises where you think about like yourself 10 years older and like, what do you wish you had done? Or if things kept on the status quo, is there something you would have regretted not doing? And that Mm -hmm. may actually help you bring the goals into the forefront. I will mention the categories really quickly that I typically look at just in case anyone needs inspiration. And that's like personal, which usually also includes relationships, um, work, (laughs) uh, family, the podcast and the blog. It's kind of funny. Um, I think those are really my main ones. And actually, Laura uses a very similar one. So when we, you know, talk about goals together, um, we usually kind of use those categories just to help kind of think about things. But you could also think about like health that might fit in with personal or spirituality or community would be a great one. So I do think the categories can kind of help because otherwise it's like, okay, you want me to just list what I want to do with my life, (laughs) you know? Um, Yeah, I think it can also um, show you if there is an area that has been not neglected maybe is too harsh a word, but that you haven't thought about in a while. And I know um, Megan does this and she, you know, is not a super structured planner person, but she's a very visionary thinker and she'll make category lists like that. I've seen her do it. Like I've seen her pieces of paper and it might even just be a plan for the week. But if she doesn't have anything under, you know, relationships, for example, or like exercise, then she knows to put something there. So it can also just be a visual way it it doesn't mean that you have to serve each category exactly equally, but you might, you might find out that there's one that you haven't thought about in a while. Yes. And I don't think it means you have to, like you said, put 10 things in each one, but at least you've thought about it. At least it's Mm -hmm. not that you're accidentally neglecting it. Maybe you're intentionally neglecting it and that's okay. Um, but just to make sure that you think about each one. Yeah. I love that. Okay. And then this next question came to us in our Instagram and, um, I thought it was another kind of great way to think about this big picture planning. Um, But she asks, where do you put the aspirational stuff so that it isn't forgotten? And again, I think this speaks really directly to those of us who are dealing with what's flying in front of us pretty efficiently. But aspirational might be like, I want to write a novel someday. It might not even be something for 2021. It might be like, I want to take a girl's trip for my 50th to Hawaii. Like, where, where can we capture that so that it's like this, it's a far off dream, but we don't want to lose sight of it. Yes. I love this question. Cause I have an answer for her. Um, <laughs> so, well, first of all, those far off dream things, I highly recommend starting. Well, one of two things, one would be a someday maybe list, which that terminology comes from David Allen's getting things done where he says, you know, something that you aren't going to do now, but might want to do. Maybe you put on your someday right. maybe list. The alternative to that is actually Laura Vanderkam's list of 100 dreams where you just sit there and brainstorm a hundred things that you want to do in your life. Maybe you want to have both lists actually, because the hundred dreams you kind of come up with all together. And the someday maybe is more like, Oh, someone mentioned some class to you and you know, you're not going to do it now, but you have a list on your phone or in your planner where you just throw it on there. I love that. So you have both of those lists and you have a list for your year, as I mentioned, and stay with me. You're going to have, you're going to make a list each quarter when the quarter starts. And then you're going to be prompted to look at that yearly list to make your quarterly list. And you might also Uh put other things or quintile lists that are happening that quintile. You're going to look at your quintile list when you make your monthly lists, mm-hmm. you're going to look at your monthly lists when you make your weekly lists, and you're going to look at your weekly lists so w- when you make your daily lists. So basically, they are nested to mm-hmm. force you to always, like, like there's always going to be a new quintile that comes around that reminds you, oh, I need to look at my yearly list. So it's not going to just get, like, forgotten. And right. perhaps you might want to set aside a note to yourself to look at that either someday maybe list or the 100 dreams list like every quintile as well. So you'd be looking at your yearly list and your maybes to think, oh, is now the time that I want to become a yoga teacher or whatever it is? (laughs) Maybe not. Okay, moving on. But at least I've looked at it. So I I, and I I know that sounds complicated. It's actually, it's like, as it's happening, it's not. (laughs) And there may be, there are so many different ways of doing that. You might have your weekly list on paper. If you use a paper planner, you might have all of it on paper. You might just have all of it in Apple Notes. I mean, it's easy to create a bunch of like nested lists. So you could just have Mm -hmm. a folder that was like 2021 and then Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, and then each month. Like, you know, it it can be as simple as you want it to be. Um, But I think the key to prioritizing and not forgetting things is to actually have a regular rhythm of reviewing these things that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Um, 
and then you'll you'll be forced to see it. Yeah. And sometimes I think people get stuck with like the the methodology or the like, where physically do I write this down? So it's refreshing to hear you say there's not a perfect planner out there that's going to help you do this. Just write it down somewhere and have the have the rhythm built into what you're doing quarterly and annually so that you don't forget to look at it. I'm definitely guilty of deciding to use a new app or system to write something down and then not seeing that note for like two years. So <laughs> Um, I think, I think what I'm hearing you say is just put it somewhere, put it somewhere and then focus on kind of that cadence or that rhythm of looking at your, at the lists you've made, even if they're a someday maybe list. So. Yes. And put it somewhere that. easy that, that you won't forget about. Um, yeah. some people use Trello. Again, I said, I use Apple notes, some people use Evernote, and then you could also just use paper. So yeah, there is no right way. Like you said to Julie, making sure you have time blocked for planning, because that's key, too. Because if you know that, you know, on the first full weekend in January, after all the holiday decorations are put away, like that's I've already blocked that time for planning with my spouse or planning on my own. Then then like then you will remember to go find those lists wherever they are. If you expect that you're just going to remember on a random Tuesday, it probably won't happen. Absolutely. You have to build those that time into your life. And it's it's easier to remember to do that if it's sort of like you said, like the first weekend of the month or I like to do it on Monday mornings or whatever your personal rhythm would be. Yeah. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar. They have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them. And I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician approved, super powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, Sarah, you ready? The people have questions. I am excited to answer them. They're actually really good questions. You have awesome listeners. Really good questions. Um, So this one comes from Jacqueline. I love this question. How does someone get back into using a paper planner after being an electronic calendar junkie? Well, my first um, question is like, make sure you want to. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you can certainly keep your calendar electronic, but if you're really enticed by the idea of perhaps keeping daily planning on paper or certain lists on paper or doing more memory type planning on paper, you can do that too. So this is not an either or scenario. You can choose to do both. If you do want to do paper, then you have to really think about like which kind of calendaring types of layouts that you need. And then you just go to best laid plans and figure out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, <you> know, no. <laughs> there are literally myriad options to fit any kind of combination of, oh, you just want monthly and daily. You need a blank page on one page. So I would really like think about the layout that you do need and think about what you really want from a planner uh, and then just dive in and know that you might switch around and that's okay. I always say like planning is actually, it, it can be expensive if you go crazy, but compared to certain other habits, like, I don't know, designer bags or shoes, it's actually like, <laughs> kind of reasonable. So just enjoy it. (laughs) I love that. I love that. Just do it. Basically jump in. Um, well, Emily asks, does Sarah have an easy way to share planning with a spouse and how often do you check in with that person you're sharing with? Now I'll add, because there was a little bit more to her question that I didn't copy over, but Emily talked about the mental load of kind of being the one to know like what's going on, even if it is on your partner's calendar as well. So I think what she's really asking here is do you have best practices for not only the technological sharing, like a shared Google calendar or whatever, but 
But the communication nuance that happens when spouses have certain things that are on both calendars and maybe have some goals that are shared goals. Like, so maybe talk generally about how the spouse fits in with the planning. I feel that. I feel like that's an entire episode and I'm probably not the guest for it. Um, But I think it's a great question. Um, And I will just I will share the logistical side of my answer just in case anyone's curious, which is that we do use Google Calendar for shared events. So if I see it, if my husband puts something in there that's relevant to the kids and he'll only put stuff if I need to know about it, like he doesn't put Mm -hmm. his work stuff in there. But um, if he if a contractor is coming to our house or like he booked a dentist appointment for the kids or something, then and I'll do the same thing and share it with him. And we we kind of use it judiciously enough that we expect the other person to look at it. Mm-hmm. But we also do have regular kind of check-ins about it. We try to do it weekly. We were better about it pre-pandemic because it kind of became a part of our date night to just like run through anything that was coming up. Um, but now we tend to do it like on Sunday nights when we have family dinner. And I have a whiteboard, which I use to like write everything that's kind of going on in the next week. So that kind of prompts him to look at it because I think having it physically there makes it harder to ignore. Now, in terms of like tips for, you know, having your partner share the load. Yeah, there's just so much on that. And um, I do think it's really, sometimes it's helpful to like, be very concrete and be like, I don't want to manage X, you can do Mm -hmm. it. And then to just step back. Like I know for Laura, her husband like does all of like the doctor's appointments, I believe. And she just knows will happen and they're his domain and that's cool and she just leaves it alone my son has this very annoying monthly project um well annoying to me i'm sure it's not yeah. annoying to everyone <laughs> so i just told my husband you are doing this project with him because i don't want to anymore and i'm not going to nag you but if he doesn't do it i'm going to tell the teacher that it was <laughs> your job <laughs> so i think being very concrete about like what's you know each other's i guess domain. jobs in a way yeah can be, domain thank you can be can be helpful I second that. And um, I did it with the dog because I had three kids. We had an older dog pass away. We got a puppy when Viola was uh, four, maybe. And I could not. I just told my husband, I was like, I already have three people to make vet or doctor appointments and other appointments grooming. The dog gets groomed more often than any of us get haircuts. I swear. <laughs> so that was one of the most freeing things. Rather than to feel like I was asking him a favor or just getting grumpy about it, I turned over an entire domain. And that I, I really second that recommendation. The other thing I would add really quickly is just remember that everybody's calendar brain works differently. I I have a gift of being able to see a week in my mind and remember dates and details really easily. Now, I can't remember the plot of any movie I've ever seen. Like I have serious deficiencies in my memory as well. But the calendar memory is very strong for me and it is not for everybody. So I would just say um, to find systems that work for the way that the two partners experience schedules. And it's been a learning curve for me to understand that not everybody has the recall that I do about dates and details. In fact, most people don't. And it's I'm a little bit more on the weird side. Um, So that's just what I would add too. is it just might take some some trial and error to find the way that naturally fits Emily's spouse's ability to be assuming he really does want to, you know, know the calendar and help with the kids and do the pickups and drop offs at the right time. He just may not have the same calendar brain than you do. And it just might take a little trial and error. So, yes. Okay. So we got a couple of questions that were similar about how to handle work and personal, both calendars and also task lists when the systems, you may not have control over the work system, for example, or it doesn't match up with your personal system. That's obviously also could be, I'm sure, an entire episode. But you do work outside the home. You're a practicing physician. And then you do all this personal planning. So any tips or tricks there? Yeah. So I think that everybody is different. For me, I certainly do keep them pretty separate. I mean, part of that is just confidentiality. I don't want to put like patient information in my paper planner because I could get in trouble for that. So Um, I kind of do keep the world separate and that's okay. The only time I guess there's any bleed through is that like if there's a work event that is outside my normal work hours, then I'm going to obviously like if it's a meeting, I'm going to put that in my planner. So hmm, how do I put this? I think you have to give yourself permission to keep them separate if it's more appropriate. 
I think one of these people was a teacher and yes, I could see Laura how teaching would teacher. have like its yeah. entire own system. And maybe you have a personal planner where it just says school from eight to three. And that's to mm-hmm. the extent of the school planning that goes in there. And that's okay. I'm sure there's about 9,000 other loose ends in your life that still could use organization. Um, and so I think you can give yourself permission to not think that your planner has to have like every little detail of everything you do and work can be a separate sphere if that's appropriate. With other knowledge workers, maybe their work doesn't involve confidential things and they do a lot of little check boxes and deep thinking and unstructured time. And then it might make sense to have them kind of all in one, but I totally get you and I am not a planner purist and I do not put my patient stuff, which is a lot of my time, (laughs) into my planner at all. Yeah, I think that's really helpful to hear. And I think, like you said, it's very specific to the work that you do and probably how your time's divided. So I know one of the people who asked that question um, is our friend Katie, who's actually regular on the podcast. Um, And she's more someone like me who has work and personal constantly overlapping at home. And so I can just add for that one that I do tend to have at least one paper. um, I call mine more of a notebook because it doesn't actually have a calendar, but it's my list making, you know, notebook. And I, it's all in one, but I literally, when you open it up and it lays flat, one side is personal and one side is work. So I can see everything all at once, but there's segmented lists. So again, I feel like we keep coming back to like, there's probably a planner out there for you and it's a little bit of trial and error, but I think it's, I I think it's really helpful to hear that those with professions that really do come with their own system don't have to merge into, you know, the, the personal planner. Yes. All right. Um, Well, I love this question came from Instagram and she asked, how do you regroup after losing an entire day or more unexpectedly? And I know we touched on this a little bit when we were talking about the pandemic, but even pandemic aside, this happens, right? Plans go awry. Absolutely. It happens to all of us, no matter how much planning that you do and how much support you have. So first you start with self-forgiveness because (laughs) nobody can control everything And then I usually do the next day if I can try to like get up early and think about how I can do damage control. If it's, oh, I have to move patients. I have to, you know, figure something out with the kids. Like I do think that sometimes the cure to plans completely getting wrecked is more planning. And I know that sounds Mm -hmm. hard and it can be frustrating, but it sometimes is the answer. But I also um, paradoxically, if things are more emotionally fraught and you've had a very rough week and it was just more about you abandoning everything, Sometimes just giving yourself a break and kind of telling yourself, you know what, like, that's okay. This week was bad. What really needed to be happening? I'll write that down to deal with it on Monday. And then just kind of allowing yourself a fresh start. Planners are the best for fresh starts because you get to just turn the page and it's a whole new week and you don't have to look at whatever, I don't know, the the phrase of the year dumpster fire (laughs) just happened beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And when in doubt, buy a new planner (laughs) if you you need a real fresh start. (laughs) Buy a new one. A hundred percent. Well, these last couple of questions both have to do with books and I'll pair them together um, and you can kind of pick which order you you answer them in. But um, one person asked, what are your some of your favorite books about planning and productivity? And I will say we can link up any in the show notes that, you know, you forget to mention or, you know, people don't have to write them down. But then also Kathy asks, how do you read so many books every month? And she (laughs) must know you and know your reading. So what's your secret to reading so much? And what are your favorite books about planning and productivity? Oh, that's so funny. I don't think I, I feel like I read a lot, but then there's so many people who read so much more than I do that it's like not that impressive. But OK, yeah. I'll start with the, the planning and productivity. So Laura Vandercombe's books, and it's not just because she's my podcast co-host. I was reading her stuff. That's how I met her, in fact. So I think they're fantastic. I love her classic 168 Hours. And um, I know how she does it. And Off the Clock are fantastic as well. I love Cal Newport's work. Um, Digital Minimalism and Deep Work are his last two books. And he also has a podcast all about habits and productivity called um, Deep Questions with Cal Newport. James Clear's Atomic Habits is, is more about habits than productivity systems. But I think it's so powerful. And it's just one of the kind of pithier, like... It's just tight and it's 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 fun to read. I read that one. I can actually yeah. say I read that one. <laughs> you get a lot out of that, right? Yeah, I, I liked that one a lot. And you know, I I really want to read Laura's books. I'm embarrassed to say I was in the throes of new motherhood when her real like when 168 hours and when I think she really um was kind of 
taking this world by storm. And I just wasn't, I wasn't thinking about productivity. I was like sleep deprived. And then I never went back and I really, um, I'm, I'm really motivated to read Laura's books because I know they've just meant a lot to so many people and they've stood the test of time. So yeah, definitely. Um, in terms of two other podcast recommendations, I will give if you're more into podcasts than books. Um, I love the Organized 365 podcast. She's more of a home organizer, but she has so many like productivity and organizing ideas that I just find fascinating. And then Michael Hyatt and now his daughter, Megan Hyatt Miller, who's taken over his company, which is called like um, they make the full focus planner and a lot of mm-hmm. other productivity um, products. I think their stuff is really good. And they actually have a um, I think it's called plan to win or something like that. Well, his podcast is lead to win. And then they have a planner focused one as well. So those are all of my favorites. Well, we will link those all up in the show notes. And how (laughs) do you read so many books every month? Okay. I don't read that many. I like this year I read 50 books. I think it will be by the end of the year. And I do track them because what you track, you are going to pay attention to. So there's no better way to get yourself to read more than actually think about whether you're reading every day. So I think that's the two things I do is I pick really good books and I highly recommend the podcast and the blog that Ann Bogle has, the What Should I Read Mm -hmm. Next? Because just I get so many fantastic um, picks from her. And then just make sure you have built in times to do it. And if it's a good book, you will find yourself reaching to do it more and more. I also have to say, giving yourself some attention on what your phone habits are, are probably going to make a big difference because I have noticed that the more I make sure that I'm not doing mindless scrolling magically, like my reading doubles. So, you know, you exchange one minute for another and I find I typically get more out of books, even though I love social media in small doses. Um, so I, yeah, I think that those are my, my two answers. I love that. I was just listening to your month in review podcast episode, which we can link up, which I was just thought was so great. And you talked about um, adding looking at your library holds list as a month in review, um, part of your rhythm for the month. And I think that's just such a smart, smart tip, um, especially for those of us who like to use our public libraries, um, that you're making sure that you're keeping yourself in stock of good books. And sometimes with the library, that takes looking ahead. So anytime we can build those things into our monthly or quarterly rhythms, um, then it, then you don't run out of books and think, what do I, you know, what should I read next? So love that. Well, Sarah, I would love to wrap up by just having you talk a little bit about um, best laid plans and maybe, I don't know, do you have any plans for that podcast <laughs> this year or do you have a place where listeners should start if they want to hop over and start listening to you there? So just talk a little bit about that podcast. Yeah, jump in anytime. It's a weekly podcast. I have a guest about once a month. Sometimes it averages out to that anyway. It's only a six month old, six month. Yeah, by this point, about six month old podcast. So it's pretty new, Um, but I'm having so much fun with it. And the topics are all about things related to planning. So like, yes, there's a weekly review one. Sometimes I'll do different planner reviews. I was especially doing a lot of those in the fall as people were trying to choose, you know, what kind of planner they might want to use for 2021. Um, Interviewing people who have different viewpoints on planning. Like um, I had somebody who does a lot of dot journaling. And then I mentioned Cal Newport earlier. He actually came on the podcast because he created a planner that was super fun. So yes, it's called Best Laid Plans. It's available at any podcast app. Um, And you can also find all of the show notes on my blog. If you go, it's also in my Instagram profile. So easy to find. If you go to the shoebox, T-H-E-S-H-U-B-O-X dot com. And then just go to that. You'll see a button that says Best Laid Plan. Just click on that and that'll take you to a list of all the episodes with the show notes, including links to listen. Or you can just search Best Laid Plans on any podcast app. And I'm at T-H-E-S-H-U-B-O-X on Instagram and um, at Shoebox underscore plans as well if you just want to see a bunch of planning pictures. <laughs> I love it. I can't believe there's this like total just community of planner people on Instagram that basically share pictures of their bullet journals and planners. I think that's deeper than, than my interest, but I love that it's there for people. There are people that have like hundreds of thousands or more followers who just post planning stuff. I am not one of them, (laughs) but it's pretty cool. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, I'm glad that it's there for people. I love that. No, it's great. Um, I love it. Do you have any idea what the beginning of this 2021 year will be for the podcast? Like, are you going to focus, are you going to have episodes that kind of center around some of these annual planning or is the content meant to be a little more evergreen where people can kind of just pick and choose their episodes or just jump in whenever? You know, for someone that loves planning, 
I do very little planning of any of the content I put out anywhere. (laughs) So it's pretty spontaneous. Some idea will just come across um, or I'll get an idea for a great guest or I'll have something happen in life. And that's that's just how I've been with my blog. And that's how Laura and I are with Best of Both Worlds as well. And it's it's been okay so far. So I'm sorry I don't have a lot of magical sneak peeks, but I do take suggestions and I love suggestions. So please send them my way. I also do um, periodic Q&A episodes. So I love getting great questions. Awesome. Well, and I was browsing your archives yesterday and it was very easy to see like which ones spoke to me and which ones I knew like they weren't tied to a particular season or a particular type of planning that would like just so I think it's it's very easy to see where you might be able to jump in. So uh, um, I might link up a couple of the ones that I really enjoyed and then people should come over or pop over and listen to Best Laid Plans. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us. Um, the show notes for this episode are always at themomhour.com and they are going to be full of links because we talked about books. We talked about other podcasts. We talked about everything that you're up to, Sarah. Plus, we talked about our episode from last year, which I think has a bunch of more planner links in it. So um, definitely everybody hop over to the momhour.com. That's where you'll find everything we talked about today and happy new year. Happy 2021. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. And Hey, I have a favor to ask and kind of a suggestion since Sarah and I were talking in this episode about how to keep track of all the things we want to do in this new year. I would love if you make a note in your planner or your calendar to set aside time once a quarter to leave reviews for the podcasts, books, and small businesses you love. It takes just a few minutes and it makes a huge difference. I'm going to be doing the same thing this year. And in fact, right after I record this, I'm going to pop over to Sarah's Best Laid Plans podcast and leave a review because I've been enjoying it so much. If you haven't left us a review yet, we would love that. But even more importantly, I think if we all make it a practice and build in time into our quarterly rhythm, we'll be helping creators and businesses we appreciate on a regular basis. Okay, everyone, Megan and I will be with you on Tuesday as we always are. And we look forward to talking to you then. Happy New Year. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or use code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash the mom hour. The mom hour is brought to you by partners like Chatbooks. Chatbooks makes it beyond easy to create beautiful photo books by importing your digital photos from anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, or directly from your phone. The books come in a variety of sizes with beautiful cover options and binding styles to choose from, and they start at just $15. Plus, we have a great deal just for our listeners. Use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20% off your purchase. Just download the Chatbooks app and use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20%.